And D2's closing will go to Jessica's at 11 slash 114 slash 5244 to 5271. And what I'll do is My Lord, a small matter of housekeeping. Your Lord should ask for references for the two documents I handed up, where they should go in the bundle. Yes. The first one, the D1's written opening. Yes. We suggest that goes to the back of bundle 11. Yes. We're going to we'll bring up dividers and put pagination for the record. It's going to be 11 slash 113, divider 113, slash 5192. To five two four three. Okay, thank you. So the first one, one will be one one four, the first one. And then the second one, D two's closing, is gonna go behind that, also in eleven. Oh right. At divider one one five. Okay. And the pagination will be five two four four. To five two seven one. My lord, we can supply pagination and then divide the pagination article. Okay. Right. Uh, I finished Stuart and Goldberg before lunch, and I wanted then to go to um, briefly to go to Articreti in the Court of Appeal. Uh, that is in the Claimants Authorities bundle at the Bible twenty four. Yeah. First of all, I'd ask your lordship to remind yourself what Mr. Justice Howells in the court below had decided. Uh, one, that the, had, the breach of the audit guidelines was uh, inexcusable, but was not determinative. What you could then do is go and consider what a court would have done had you brought an application before, before the court, the counterfactual scenario. And the Lordship gets that at paragraphs 9 to 21 of the Court of Appeal Judgment. So the Lordship, 473 to 474, if the Lordship would remind yourself of that. The paragraph 14 in particular. And on 
those facts of paragraph 17 he found that in court, the fact the court would not have entertained. Yeah. Okay. And then going on to the Court of Appeal treatment of that, it goes forward at 47 for our purposes. Yeah. First of all, at 47, what was meant he addresses there, the other rather, she addresses there is um, what was meant by no excuse for not complying with all he meant there should be no exception. That's 47. Uh, and it reminds of 48 importance of the ordinary guidelines. However, she says, it must be tempered at 49 by the fact that it's not an automatic abusive process if you fail to cover it. And that's what you get out of 49 of the law, she reads that. Thank okay. you. And just going forward uh, in 52, upholding the judges that the judge was clearly entitled to assess the seriousness of the breach and so to seek to determine what would have happened if the necessary application had been <coughs> made, so she approves the hypothetical scenario. And at 53, importantly for our purposes, the judge was bound to consider the measure of the prejudice suffered. That was one of the relevant circumstances, but Mr. Mallet is unable to point out any very specific examples of prejudice. The party is so more than the generalised prejudice of the strike there. So, um, a breach in England, under the English jurisdiction, a breach of the Aldi guidelines, case management guidelines, are not even an abuse, automatic abuse there. Still less so, we say, here, where no diff court has held that they apply here yet, unlike the rule of the abuse of process, which, of course, was in the TVN case, and was held to apply in 2014. So your lordship may well find that they should apply here. It would be the first judgment to that effect, and thus a failure to observe such an obligation back in 2013 must surely, we say, be less heinous than it, even it would be in England. Don't forget, no judgment in 2013 that Henson Henson even applied here can come into 2014. We do accept, my learned friend notes, that it's relevant for the court if no prior warning was given, and if so, why not, the seriousness of any breach, and what would have happened if warning given. So how we behave, consciously or unconsciously, is of course relevant, but it's not as much as a sacred text that the Aldi guidelines here uh, yet, as we said, my learned friend makes out. Now, my learned friend made two arguments, I think, to say that Aldi really already applies, one of which is, I think, that it's imported by the overriding objective uh, to apply, and I think that uh, it, it might be a reason why they should apply, or what you might decide that they should apply, but it can't be said that they are made applicable by the overriding objective. And my own friend also relied on the rules of the, of the, of the court 2.10.3. I'll just remind your lawyer what that says. Um, D. Claimants Authorities 32. Sorry, Defendants Authorities. That's not what the D here is. And the, the argument was made that because 4.16 of the rules here, page 560, do not spell out the, all the requirements, they can nevertheless be a, the, the, white, the rules in the, at the CPR and in the white book can be applied by, by reference to the rule 2.10, page 559, the submission I made this morning. But of course that is taking the powers of 2.10 uh, too far, because it says there, if no provision is made or no appropriate form is provided by the rules, then rules can be supplied to fill in a gap. But of course there is a provision addressing strike out, exactly at 4.162, and uh, suggests that they can apply these rules using that Filling uh, provision, supplementary provision, would be mean that these rules would never, the difficulty never in fact be autonomous, would be completely adequately constant. So I think that's stretching 2.103 too far. Um, a final point on the law uh, at this stage is the, the question of fraud claims. And I don't need to take your lawsuit to the authority. You have to take care when pleading a fraud claim. You have to be satisfied about credible, credible uh, evidence. We, we provide the citations in our uh, skeleton at um, paragraphs 41 to 42. I won't take too much. You're well aware of that. Um, 
and the applicable diff laws are also referred to there. What we ask is, just thinking about that point, in the context of Henderson and Edison, and when considering when a claim could have been brought, perhaps even more importantly, considering when it should have been brought, it, it must be reasonable for a claimant to plead a case in fraud against the bank only when a minimum threshold has clearly been passed and only when major losses crystallised or not. I mean, in the 2009 proceedings, don't forget the 2009 proceedings as it is now, the defendants took every point against the claimants, including on one occasion obtaining a strike out of a pleading of ours, on the basis of a pleading of fraudulent misrepresentation on the basis that it had been inadequately pleaded. That was a decision of Mr. Justice Yakub on the 7th of July 2010. So, uh, it, it did, it, we need to be careful, in, but the need to be careful about being brought has raised its head specifically in these proceedings uh, as well. And so when my learned friend says it's sort of fanciful to suppose that uh, they would have objected to the pleading of fraud just before trial, for the reasons we give, we must ask the Lord to take that with a pinch of salt. Turning then Yeah. Turning then to the question of, of could, first question, could we have brought them? Um, the first preliminary point I want to make is that the court's focus should really be on whether the claimant could have brought them prior to the 2013 trial, so it could have been decided at that hearing. We submit that after a, such a lengthy preparation of the hearing of that trial, there was no realistic chance of these fraud claims being heard as to liability or substance after that trial in those proceedings. So had we had the liability trial, it's very unlikely we could have then had a second liability trial. If it hadn't brought the claims in by then, it would have been told really to go off into the new proceedings. We rely on the fact, as I took your lordship to earlier, the court in 2015 did not let in a much smaller element of the new claim, a subset of the losses, into those old proceedings. Uh, and I think the fact that it's, it, it, it's very unlikely after the 2013 trial such claims could have got into those proceedings is more or less accepted by my learned friend. If you look at his skeleton at page 100, it says that bringing those losses after the trial was far too late, and the law should have saw their, their submissions in 2015 for that effect. I don't take my learned friend really is differing radically on, on this effect. So that's the question of, it's really all about whether they could have been brought before the 2013 trial. The second preliminary point is that while perhaps maybe the, the claimant could have known about his fraud claims against the bank prior to the 2000 <coughs> trial from the claimant's pleadings and disclosure of the witness statement, he did not in fact know the relevant facts and appreciate their significance until shortly before or after the trial. We get this uh, from paragraphs 14 to 16 of his fourth witness statement which is in bundle one of the Bible 19. So bundle one, yeah. divided 19. Yeah. At par pages, uh, uh, paragraphs 14 to 16, that's a dis it's witness statement support of this application, opposition to this application. So what he's saying is, he, he, two things, I didn't know until very shortly before trial that the, he himself, until the, the defendants were claiming that the, that, that money was, uh, the 10 million was to meet a margin call. And secondly, at 15, I did not properly appreciate until evidence was given that there had been a margin call or the significance of that. I well recall stuff that matter was to know after the evidence had been given by Mr. Wilder at the trial expressing my complete surprise what was being said by him. So, it, maybe he should have done what she would say, but we say, as a matter of fact, that he didn't. He was found to be a reliable uh, witness of truth by Mr. John Chadwick, and there's been no application to cross-examine him on that, on that statement in the nine months or so since it's been put in. I don't see that my friend has lost a serious attack on that uh, statement. He's sort of questioned it, but um, we say that there really isn't any reason to do so. 
My learned friend Skeleton, paragraph 89, uh, makes two points about the reliability of Mr. Carafi uh, evidence in the previous proceedings as now, which I think is probably fair to look at if we just do that. It makes four points, but I think there are only two points of substance. Uh, it's a paragraph of 89, which is page 28. This is against the background of demonstrably unreliable evidence from the claimants of blowing horse and cold solids. When it suited the claimants, they were content for their lawyers to portray those people with substance. Now it does not suit. In November 2014, C1, that's my client, saw fit to tell the court he had no outstanding liabilities to ABK. Now he urges that his indebtedness to ABK. Yeah, sorry, where are you? I am on page 28. Paragraph 89A. I'm so sorry, Michael. I'm in, I'm in the, the... Yeah, I've got it now. Yeah. yeah. Well, this is on impecuniosity, really, more than anything Yes. Yeah. So I, I, I'm just trying to focus. You introduced this section of your submission on the basis that you were discussing whether something could be done rather than it should be done. And as I understand it, you say that it could not have been done before, the, shortly before the trial, because it's only then, if I may put it rather facetiously, that the penny drops. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. That, that's what we're saying. And, and what we say is that there's, there's nothing in the you know, material to undermine the claims evidence that he did not actually himself know. Now, going on to could, so we deal with the fact that he could, whether we could have brought the, the claim. What we say is, we accept that knowing what the claimant was actually told in August 07 about the 10 million, we might arguably have pleaded fraud upon receiving the disclosure of the defendants in August 2012, which I think is where more or less my other friend ended up yesterday. But bearing in mind that we need to be careful about pleading fraud, we submit that we could not have done so safely until, at the earliest, the service of Mr. Wiley's witness statement in April 2013, just a month before trial, which confirmed on oath at paragraph 163 to 4, I take it, the defendant's case that such a collateral shortfall existed and that he had made such a margin call. Your lawsuit will be aware it wasn't entirely clear, even at trial, that a margin call had been made by the ten, as regards to the 10 million, as the documents themselves show the 10 million going into an investment with the other 30 million of, of, of lending. So given that confusion, we think we, we submit it's acceptable to wait until after trial, after witness statements, or even after trial finding by the judge to establish whether a margin call was in fact being made or not at that time. And that is just, would be about fraud against D1. You've still got to show agency for, uh, against uh, D2 to get to D2. Now, the difficulty here is that because this is a different fact, a different elements to the existing proceedings, this was a question about whether Walia's, Walia's statement making a margin call was in the course of his actual authority from the, from the bank. And the difficulty here is obviously established that the margin call was in fact being made, but if it was made, there's no, there wasn't credible evidence that he had actual authority, anything from within the bank, to make margin calls on behalf of the bank. And that was improved dramatically, the lawsuit saw, by that passage. I took your lordship to, which he said actually it was habitual practice for us uh, the CRMs to make margin calls on behalf of the bank. Um, so that uh, position was improved, and so it, it, that, that certainly took one uh, over the line on that front. And there would have been, we say, there might have been difficulties on establishing apparent authority on the, 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 the hypothetical scenario in circumstances where he was actually, he said to us, this is a conversation about my own, improving my own chances. I want you to pay the money to assist me personally in that. Is that really apparent authority? So, so those, were the, those were the question marks, if you like, as to why it would have been reasonable not to have, not to have pleaded it. Until you're absolutely sure, until after, certainly after witness statements, and probably after, after the judgment itself. Um, uh, so that, I think that's what we say. We doubt, of course, when Edward Crumb points out that the question of agency was an issue, 
but it wasn't an issue about the making of margin calls. That was my point. So that's on the pleading of fraud. But of course, the, the pleading of fraud is not complete until the question of loss is. Now, on that question, the first point I think is important is what we call the wrong end of the telescope point. My learned friend spent much of yesterday afternoon saying how we could have brought these loss claims into the 2009 proceedings as they stood without the new claims. But of course, your Lordship is not being asked to decide if the first claim could have brought these losses into the 2009 proceedings. Lordship is being asked, whether these, asked to consider whether these new claims before you are abusive, and that means on this issue, deciding counterfactually if once a deceit claim or other claim founded on the dishonest statement was properly pleadable, the losses were also or could not have been pleaded until later. If immediately a deceit claim was obvious, which may be at the trial or after, then it is from this date that such losses are pleadable if they were known. So if the deceit pleadable date is so close to the trial, it means that it could have not have got the deceit claims in, then you could not have got the losses in earlier. So that's what we want asking the lawsuit to focus on. Now, we say the, loss, the losses claimed in respect of the deceit claims could not have been pleaded before the 2013 trial because, one, there was no pleasable case, as you say, on our submission of deceit at that time, and two, although plainly, as we say and as we accept, the claimant knew about some losses before then, he would only have known his overall losses on the crystallisation of those losses in relation to the end of the two tower projects in 2014. And we address that in detail in our skeleton and our request for response to further information at 1785 to 86. In effect, had those two projects been rescued, then any claim may not have been brought. And we address this also in our skeleton at 56. Now, my only friend rightly says that we could have brought incorrect claims, suggest not in proposition. Arguable suggestion, maybe, but we would argue that it's not so clear that we could have brought them before suffering final loss that we would have crossed the Henderson and Henderson line. We may well have faced arguments that no loss has suffered yet. So, surely it was sensible to wait until, would, would have been hypoth hypothetically sensible to wait until sure of the overall losses, especially as the different claims and losses to the ongoing proceedings weren't relevant to those proceedings. Now this, I accept, may be a stronger argument on whether we should have pleaded the case at that time, so that it would have been reasonable not to have brought them back at that time, rather than technically could. And indeed, if your logic is not with us on whether we, we could have pleaded the fraud claim and the losses earlier than the 2013 trial for the reasons we've given, then we would argue that the points of uncertainty that I have raised would point to a defence on the should issue. I.e., it's not wholly clear that we could have brought such claims. If understandable grey areas, then we would argue that counterfactually it wouldn't have been unreasonable if we did not bring them at that time, even if we could have done. Finally, on could, even if your Lordship finds that these new claims could have been pleaded before, including the losses, then we argue that whilst they could have been pleaded, that's your finding, they could not have got into the 2013 trial, as the court would have rejected the introduction of such different claims at a late stage, given the prejudice to the trial date fixed, as your Lordship knows, by Sir John Chadwick in May 2012. Especially as there was no split liability quantum trial at that point, there was, it was all one matter. And so the question of these losses was so radically different, it couldn't conceivably be said, uh, have been addressed at that trial. So more likely than not, they would have been entirely uh, put off. Now obviously, the strength of this mission it depends on the, what date your Lordship finds that they could have been pleaded if your Lordship does, but there must be quite force in this. If, if your lordship finds that it could only be pleaded following service of the Wiley witness statement in April 2013, one month before trial, and still good at following disclosure of 
even if it following disclosure of documents in, in, in 2012, at that point it's only six to eight months before we, a trial has been in preparation for four years and are likely to lessen for the <coughs> So it's less strong on the second round, <coughs> but, but certainly very strong if it's only on the witness stand, we would submit. And in those cases, Barrow and Bank side would apply. So that's what I wanted to say on could. If the Lordship is against us on could and considers that these could have been brought prior to 2000 in the trial, then we, the defendants have still not shown, and the defendants have the burden of proof, that we should have done. In other words, we argue that hypothetically, counterfactually, it would have been reasonable in all the circumstances for the claimants not to bring them to do so until bring them in these proceedings. And we say this for six reasons. The first is that the new claims are, as I hope I've shown in the quite different to the existing claims involving radically different losses. More like the situation we say in Stuart and Goldberg. As we say, very unlikely the court would have let them into the 2013 trial even if we had brought them up, especially as at that time no split liability quantum trial. It, only the application could only have been brought late, would have taken up significant court time and resources to seek to have done so, and unlikely to have had success. In those circumstances, would it be so unreasonable not to have brought uh, the, the uh, uh, attempt to bring them in proceedings at that time? First one. Secondly, counterfactually, at most, we suggest in the defendant's favour that the court may have let in the liability claim as regards the, the liability aspects of the new issues, but then hived off causation and quantum on the new claims to a separate quantum trial to the issues before him. Then, as I say, the issues before him was all the issues, including the, the loss issues, and they were all the narrow, direct loss issues. Only split or loss should be called actually during the trial. So, more like if, if they let in the liability claims or the new claims, but really been on the basis that these were going to be hived off separately. Indeed, but even if the judge had decided, well, I'll, this, I'll take this opportunity to split everything at this stage, we still suggest it would be much more likely that you would have had two quantum trials at first quantum trial on the narrow direct losses of the ABQ relationship concerning the products, and then a second, much bigger causation and quantum trial concerning these property losses with quite different issues arising. Um, you also saw the, the radically different losses in, in Sir Richard Field. And indeed, this is what defendants say may have happened with paragraph 109 of their skeleton. There may well have been a sequence of, of quantum trials. But we say, if that is right, that is in effect what has happened. So the defendant is no, no worse off. That is, that liability has in fact largely been decided by the judge's findings, it may be a bit more, but not a great deal. And the bulk of this trial will be about causation of quantum. And if that is correct, then the defendants will be no worse off than what has happened. Then our conduct would not have been unreasonable, and there would not be unjust harassment. And indeed, there is no specific evidence of prejudice. So that was the second reason. Third reason, not to have, would it be unreasonable not to have brought, brought them in? If they were let in and dealt with altogether, that is, no hiding off of anything, then by necessity, the whole trial would have had to have been substantially delayed, resulting in significant further delays for the claimants to receive any compensation from the defendants. Your lordship knows that took an age in, in itself, thanks to my own friend's client's World War I defence, to get to the judgments of 10 million, which we received late in 2016, nine years after the events in question, after appeal, uh, and 60 million, also late in 2016, now, after the quantum appeal in 2017, the judgment of the court of appeal, <coughs> 10 years. So it kept out of, of much of the wrongs after 2000 for nearly 10 years. Would it have been unreasonable to expect 
it would have been, we say, unreasonable to expect the defendants to suffer much further delay in those judgments so that these different uh, claims could have been considered and adjudicated upon at the same time for the, uh, for the reasons of court efficiency and the, and the claimants. The fourth point on should, even if they could have been brought in, it's not unreasonable, we say, and this is what I, I foreshadowed this when talking about could, but not to plead the claims until entirely sure of Wiley's, Mr. Wiley's dishonesty and agency. The confusing position about the marginal call had uh, been established by the judge and all the losses crystallized. We rely in particular here, as we say, on the rule of not in pleading fraud, and it's absolutely sure, and indeed of what had happened with the defendants in our particulars in the 2009 proceedings. Fifth reason. No misconduct in the, in the Aldi sets is what we say. Whether or not Aldi applies technically, there was no, fundamentally no misconduct. Nothing was deliberately withheld from the, by, by the claimant from the 2013 trial judge, which was the special mischief underlined by what well, I said in Clark and Stewart and Goldberg. It was not a case of hiding things, but not being alive to them. Importantly, and as we said before, on the counterfactual situation, the effect of any breach would have been negligible for the reasons that I've gone through already on the counterfactual situation. Um, further, the claims would have been as visible to very well and expensively advised bank as to us. They arose from their disclosure and their statements. It's a situation in Stuart, a similar way, but it said well, it wasn't the case of something being hidden, a fact which the bank was unaware of. They were well aware, they must well aware, continue to be well aware of what this matter may have meant to them. So we suggest the failure to reveal to the bank can have a limited impact either. Um, and um, those are my those are my suggestions on should and on on all dear. What I then wanted to touch on was the funding position. Now, the Lordship will recall Lord Bingham's judgment in Johnson, which he said he could see it might be of relevance, uh, especially if it appeared to be caused by the defendant's contract. <coughs> it's not a central point, but it's a relevant, may be relevant. So in these circumstances, I'm not going to spend ages on it now, but I am going to rely largely on what we say in paragraph 67 to 77 of our skeleton. But we will, however, say uh, the following. We'll ask our Lordship to pick up the, the claimant's witness statement, which gives a convincing description of what was going on in 2012. I ask them, the Lordship to pick up final one. Uh, divide on 19. Starting at paragraph 70. And going to paragraph 26. The Lordship just reads that for now. Up to uh, 26. Yeah, I've read that. Have you read so that? The, the strike code, what was that? I don't remember that. Uh, which paragraph? Uh, paragraph 26. The case was struck out. 
That was um, jurisdiction. Oh, I see. Strafad. That's right. We say that's a convincing description of how the mis-selling caused him serious financial problems by 2012, including the selling of personal assets. And that must be understandable in such a way. The courts have found he did suffer losses uh, of 35 million from the mis-selling, which were unpaid at that time. He was spending a huge amount of money on legal fees to get the claims to accept their legal obligations. Was over fighting tooth and nail. And then. His description of the Vanning litigation problems is equally uh, persuasive. If you read, we will ask your lordship to read from 27 to 30. And this is just before trial. This is just the moment when it's being suggested we would have uh, been wanting to introduce these new claims. It shows the, the terrible problems he had with that shortly before trial when they cut funding for the existing claims uh, in, the, in the chaotic events of February to March. And your Lordship can well imagine. <coughs> your Lordship can well imagine. Now, the claimant's description of these events is corroborated by the vivid description given by Mr. Nur of, this, of that period in paragraph 36 to 46 of his witness statement on the 15th of July. And we can see that. In, Mr. in Sir Richard Field's judgment, which the Lord already had to look at, but not this passage. So I asked the Lord to pick up bundle 10. Divider And this is when the judge was addressing issues between Vannin and my client uh, over their dispute post-trial. Yeah. And what he, at page 5051, you'll see he, the judge quotes Mr. Mill's witness statement, paragraphs 28 to 50. And if we go to 5052, yeah. he deals with the, the, the starting sequence of events when Mr. Cousins, QC gave his opinion and what actually happened. And I ask the Lordship to read to yourself paragraphs 36 through to, fifth through to uh, 49 to show the sort of chaos that was going on at that time. Yeah. Bassett and Fountain of KVH, should he? Yes. Was unfair, unfair. And if you launch it, we'll reach paragraph 46. What they do? Yeah, 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 I'm ready to 
Against that background, it's, it's not unreasonable, we say, that, uh, that to submit that it would have been practically impossible for the claimants to bring those new claims immediately before, before the 2013 trial. No funds for the new claims himself, and Vanden would not have funded it given the difficulties that they were facing in pursuing the existing claims. Now, my learned friend makes a number of uh, forensic points to try and undermine the effects of uh, my client's evidence, and, which I addressed in our skeleton. But I will say a few points. Yeah. As regards my own friend's attempts to claim that previous evidence and submissions made on my client's behalf in the 2009 proceedings show that they could have funded such claims easily himself, and those are the ones that he took a lawsuit to in paragraph 69 to 73 of the skeleton. All of the examples relied on simply show that Mr. Carafi had some illiquid assets of his own. They do not show that Mr. Carafi had an extra cash wherewithal to take on the funding of these substantial new claims. Well, I know my own friend underplays the amounts that require, but you also can see we've already between us spent $1.5 million and we've yet to get a defence, my own friend. The, 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 the way these matters were fought by my own friend in the, the, in the, in the matter of proceedings would have been these, these new claims would have required substantial extra funding. Now, Sir Richard Field highlights our evidence uh, below that we had cash flow problems, not asset problems. We accept that and rely on that. And that I don't need to go that. The reference is 10102, paragraph 75. He also, in a separate judgment on the 29th of January 17, highlighted the difference between assets and cash flow in funding claims in his judgment. And that is in bundle 11. At 5124. 73, in the context of this, I'll ask your Lordship to read yourself paragraph 73, and in particular the passage in the middle. When the, he about when the judge said in paragraph 17 there's still no evidence that claims any of them were positioned to be paid as well as before or after claims were paid. He meant there's no evidence that claims had available assets they ought reasonably to have used to be paid the sum of the I say this with judge would have been well aware that the respondents had valuable assets, many of which were securing their liabilities to ABK. He would also be well aware that asset values had fallen and remained diminished, and there would be a considerable cost in paying some of the last box of shares to have paid for the circumstances of them, that was not simply some had such assets, it was less that they could unreasonably pay off the loads. We say the same yeah. principle would apply. Yeah. Now, as to the idea put forward by my learned in front of Skelton, that the claim is, well, if he was illiquid, he has well placed to borrow further funds for litigation. We say they were, the claims were already in, in debt as to enormous sums due to the defendant's actions in 2007 and defences and the defence of the, of the claims, very expensive defence of the claims. Not unreasonable, surely, for the claimants to wait for receipts and compensation from the old claims before starting new, different claims with limited effect on the defendants. Anyway, as your lordship has seen, Mr. Noor gave contemporaneous evidence, or gave evidence about the contemporaneous events shortly before trial, where they did try to raise funds to get the case going, and they couldn't in the time available. It was impossible. You also have noticed, in respect of this, that the, the chaos that Mr. Noor describes at the last minute cancellation of funds and then the renegotiation of the new agreement more favourable to them. Uh, and also, we looked at it about how you can simply cut funding, and it looks the way they cut the funding, cancel the agreement, and then 
got a new agreement more in their favour. It looked like a shake down what was the appearance of that. And indeed, the law should know that when the claimants came to dispute with Bennett after the case, and they argued that the second agreement was void for duress, that Sir Richard Field thought they had a good arguable case on that point. Now, the banks do attempt in their skeleton at 75 to rely on their, the claimant's refusal, my client's refusal, to answer certain requests for responses for information as to the claimant's net assets positions in 2010. But those requests about net asset positions were not required to enable the defendants to plead to the case. There are very strict rules about requests, and they're the same rules that are in England. They have to be confined to matters which are reasonably necessary and proportionate for the defendant to prepare their own case or understand the case he has to leave. They were plainly in breach of these rules as the claimant's case was clear on its face was being said. As to the detail, we say the claimants would have got that on disclosure. Those are all the authorities of Dyer and Pilimini and so forth. Now, that was a position taken by the claimants to those requests for information. If they consider, the reason why we say, if they consider we were wrong at law in law and that, they've had, we've had nine months to go to court to try to get an order to compel us to answer those. But they haven't. Rightly, we say, as they knew the requests were improper. We say the lawsuit cannot then rely on what we put as a reasonable and proper response to the further information as a reason to doubt our evidence here. Related to that, my learned friend made a submission today that we face as strict an evidential burden in relation to this issue as claimants do improving in pecuniosity to avoid a security for cost or the journal should recall that. Mm. Now, in security of the cost orders, the, the court has to be certain that the claimant is impecunious and that the claim will be stifled. And thus, the claimant has to bring all the evidence of finances to prove it. But that is not the same test we say here. Whilst impecuniosity is central to security for cost, it's not central to a Henderson and Henderson application, but only, as I said, not necessarily irrelevant. In reality, we say your lordship should treat the evidence submitted as part of the broad factual matrix against that which you require to make an overall decision. So I think that's all I need to say on that one. I want to turn to Vanu. My learned friends claim that Vanu would have presented no serious obstacles towards the claimant producing, pursuing any new claims prior to the 2000, sorry, the, 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 what's the topic? Vanu, the litigation fund. Yeah. What he submitted was, Vanu would have presented no serious obstacles towards the claimant pursuing any new claims prior to the 2013 trial. We say this is, this is absurd. The bank in its skeleton, at paragraphs 83 to 86, says there was no evidence that Vanu or other funders would have refused to pay for the new claims if they'd been asked. And that is, that's, that, we wouldn't accept that. There's very good evidence in the fact that Vanu stopped their funding of the existing claims shortly before the 2013 trial uh, entirely, and only resuming them just before the trial, when they cut the funding they committed to by a further £950,000. The idea that they would have cheerfully stumped up more money at that point for different claims with different losses in time to get an application heard and adjudicated that trial doesn't seem realistic in light of the evidence we've seen. Uh, especially when with the trial not being split at that time, the applications we say would either be rejected or cause delays in the existing proceedings. And more evidence of the attitude of Van can actually be seen from the restated uh, litigation finance agreement, the litigation funding agreement at 458. Let me What they wanted was a return. They didn't want more litigation. They wanted less litigation. The Lordship sees at 1731, sorry, bundle four, divider 
And at 25.12, the new provision that wasn't in there before, must use its best endeavours to negotiate with those good faith attempts prior to trial to settle the claim. So, what is that? 24.12. Yeah, okay. That's a new provision not there before. That was our attitude. Yeah. Now, my learned friend also put forward the suggested that Vanin, in fact, had no control over the use of their funds, so it could not have stopped the claim using Vanin's funds for the new claims. We say that's fanciful, that's in the defendant's In this respect, the defendants make the point that as under, you could be see under the, the Code of Conduct, for Al's Code of Conduct and the litigation finance agreements, Vanin could not stop the claims being made because it was not entitled to control the litigation, either as a matter of policy or in the, or in the, in the actual agreements themselves. Now, with respect, we say this misses the point. Vanin, under the LFA, had agreed to fund the existing claims. They could not control how that was done. Principle. The practice may be different, but in principle. They had not agreed to fund the new claims and thus could stop their funds being used to litigate them. That would have given Vanin the veto in effect, for they didn't have other funds to do it. Now, your Lordship can see this, I'll make this good, by reference to the litigation funding agreement in bundle 3. Divide of 47. First of all, we're going to look at provision 1.2. So this provision? Uh, 108.5. Yeah. 1.2. The claim to which this agreement relates. The claim. Yeah. Is a claim against the person loss of arriving out of investments in various structural files was undertaken by the person after their client. Uh, client. 1.2. If you go over to 8, which is at 109.5, what is covered by this agreement? When in, and you'll thought you read the beginning to yourself above 8.1.1. You'll see what is covered is the claim is set out in the amended particulars of the claim, amended defence and reply. And that does contain the important words as further amended from time to time, which I'll address. But what, for the first instance, it's only covering, as you would expect, the existing claims. Now, the common sense indicates that as amended from time to time would be consistent with those existing <coughs> claims and not to bring in further and new different claims, funding further losses which would delay trial and recovery times. That would be the common sense interpretation and the <coughs> paragraph 30 of the litigation. Clause 30 asks for a common sense interpretation. Whether as a matter of construction after no doubt more litigation, that is the correct meaning. The fact is, is that it certainly would have given Vanden an argument that um, their funds only covered the existing claims and they could not be used to cover the new claims. And these new claims are substance, these radically different claims. They could have used all sorts of arguments. So we say, in practice, a veto arising out of this clause. I think that's all I want to say on funding at this stage, other than it's set out in my scope. Of some relevant to be said. Now, as to the post-2013 events. Yeah. As I think we've said, if, if, if we, my class cannot be criticised for bringing them into the 2013 trial at A40, all right, if your logic finds that, it would, it would have been reasonable not to try and bring these new claims into the proceedings after the liability trial. I think, as I said, I, I don't think there's any earthly chance of that happening in those proceedings. Uh, and the lawsuit seems to have happened. 
I make other reasons why uh, it wouldn't have been it would have been reasonable not to have sought to bring them in post the 2013 trial in our skeleton of paragraphs 81 to 84, but I'm not going to dwell on those because I, I, don't, I think they're very clear on that phase. I then want to turn to the question about unjust harassment or otherwise abusive in all the circumstances. What we say there is, even if your lordship was against us on could and should, the overall facts of this case do not make this an abusive set of proceedings. First point, the overall extra burden is, we say, minimal. The extra burden key there. The key issues on liability have been decided by the judge anyway, i.e. the statement was made by Mr. By Mr. Wiley. It was made to try and get us to pay a ten million margin call without telling us it was a call. Intentional deceit. So the back should be, as we say, fixed with liability. Causation of quantum terms would have been done separately anyway, so we say no extra burden. Realistically, therefore, the only extra burden on the defendants in having these second proceedings are the breach of information and advisory duty claims in, in those in particular as I took the lordship to evolve establishing a duty of care and so forth. But we say in circumstances where the judge has already found that the second, first and second defendant both own contractual duties of care in relation to the selling of products, this should not occupy a trial judge too much. If, however, your lordship was to find that the inclusion of the breach of duty claims made the new proceedings abusive because of this extra burden on the parties brought in by them, then we would submit that the proper course would be to decline to permit those claims only to proceed. Indeed, if, if your lordship strikes those claims are anywhere as being out of time, i.e. my learned friend was on limitation, then they cannot proceed anyway. And those proceedings will not add any to the extra burden to the defence. That was the, that point. First point on, on that. Strong fraud claim. We also say this is a rare case where the strong merits of the new claim do justify the case advancing as envisaged by Lord Justice Lloyd and Stuart and Goldberg. At a fortiori, we say when there is a strong claim in fraud, underlying fraud, DIFC public policy with its reputation as an emerging international financial centre, is to be harsh on fraud. We know that because it highlights whether special treatment fraud is given in limitation terms. We say this must be especially so when the defendant involved is a wealthy Swiss bank who has come secretly to the DIFC to do business without a licence and to whom the minor extra litigation burden involved would be little. And I have made my submissions on the strength of the fraud claim by the I come now to the question of whether the defendant's conduct in the 2009 proceedings disentitles them from complaining about harassment. That's how it's supposed to discuss it. My own friend took objection to that. We say, however you put it, it is relevant that the, the, the bank did adopt a tooth and nail scorch earth policy to the last proceedings, and hoping no doubt to exhaust us and our funders, having caused us great losses. We say it's, it's conduct which makes claim that they are subject to unjust harassment, something oppressive, as absurd. At the very least, it shows that they're quite comfortable with and can easily afford litigating heavily in these courts. And accordingly, any limited extra burden of these proceedings cannot truly be seen as abusive or oppressive towards the bank in these circumstances. Something that may be oppressive to a disadvantaged elderly individual may not be oppressive, oppressive towards a wealthy Swiss bank. It depends on the person or the entity, especially as we see whether a strong, strong case of fraud. So what, what is the, what, what, the evidence on the tooth of their fighting, the lordship, I think, very well aware of it, but, but uh, the bank unsuccessfully contested jurisdiction up to the Court of Appeal, delayed matters for 18 months. Uh, it struck out, um, it would, service of our claims went in on, on the, in that respect, service of our claim on the bank was on 8th of June 2010, 
It was struck out by Chief Justice Wang on the 31st of March 2011, and then restored on the 5th of January 2012, and there are hearings in between that. That's a long and heavily contested period. It sought and failed to get security for costs up to the Court of Appeal. It tried and failed to get the claims struck out. As your Lordship knows, in liability, it contested every point of appeal, including factual findings your Lordship found to be unassailable. Your Lordship found her appeals on this as clearly misconceived, and that's the reference of 10.101.4972. It's strenuously objected uh, in each and every way to the payment of the liability sums, notwithstanding the judge's order. I ask your Lordship just to remind yourself of this. Ms. Hanlon's evidence in bundle 9 divided 79. Page 4235. Mm -hmm. I'm in bundle 9, divider 79. And I, I ask you to sorry, it's 4231, and the efforts there made by the defendants to avoid paying money into court. It's <coughs> to 4233. Sorry, what am I reading? I'll ask you to read your lawsuit to read uh, paragraph 4C, in effect, of Ms. Hammond's witness statement of the 12th of November 2014. In the period between the handing down the judgment, the post-judgment hearing, which is a relatively short period, you'll see the events between a matter of months, between uh, court events between one, between those two days. Just, uh, just as far as little nine. Nearly there. Context of uh, the funding. There was one point I missed. Learned, uh, my learned friend said our evidence on funding was inconsistent in one hearing and the other. I'll come back to that again. Once I finish, let, let me just finish the points on the abuse. Uh, my learned friend, in relation to his views, also said, towards the end of his proceedings, end of his submission, that bringing our claims in breach of the jurisdiction agreement held by the Court of Appeal to apply uh, was abusive in itself. It's a one factor that would rely on abusive. And we say we were, they were properly brought these proceedings uh, in line with the Court of Appeals' judgment that we could bring these proceedings against C1 and C2. The fact that C2 has gone into liquidation is not, with all due respect, after what we would say is parents' fault, and why proceedings are not going uh, forward in that respect. We would say that we, my own friend, his taking of this point appears curious when it has not 
In its acknowledgement of service form, which we have seen, it did not tick the box of dispute jurisdiction. It has, as we've also seen, asked for time to and obtain time to file a defence. It's asked further information. It's seeking the court uh, assistance here in, uh, in, in seeking to strike out these claims. In all these circumstances, it's, it's, its acceptance of the jurisdiction uh, over the past two years has been uh, so extensive, and in, uh, in law it's certainly enough, and I'll ask the lordship uh, uh, to, to note the author relevant authority, which is Global Multimedia International Limited against ARA Media Services, uh, in 2006 EWHC 3612. It, in law, it is uh, sufficient to take off that, but also in Henderson Henderson terms, we are, how could it conceivably really be abusive to be said to be persistent with these procedures when, in these circumstances, uh, they haven't taken the objection to it and they have gone along with it? So uh, it seems to me a point that's been taken simply now uh, to rather assist my own friend's position as best he might. Um, just on the point, there was a, some factual points on their scales, and I said I'll take the Lordship to you, and the Lordship said we'll do it in the context of funding. It's paragraph 89 of their skeleton. Yeah. <coughs> and on the question of, of, they make some points about how, well, we say one thing and we, we say another, but it suits us. And the 89A, they say when it suited the claimants, they were content with their laws and employees portrayed them as people of substance. Now it does not suit. The, uh, they sing a different song. In November 2001, saw fit to tell the court that he had no outstanding liability to ABK1. Uh, now he urges his indebtedness ABK has not gone away, and his wife is still being pursued for an excess of 30 million. That's at 52. And my point there. If we go to what is said, what he says in November 2014, it is completely consistent with what he says about his lovers. He's not going away. The Lord should see that uh, by going to bundle 9, divided 81. At page 4240. <coughs> And your Lordship reads yourself 1.2a and b. I think your Lordship will see the point which we Yeah, well, I've heard see it before. Yes. But what, 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 I know, what, what hasn't been drawn to your attention is. What he's saying now, as a result of that settlement, the first and second claimant have no outstanding liabilities to ABK, aside from their guarantees referred to in paragraph B below. And a paragraph B below are the very liabilities that he then talks about in these proceedings. Yeah. And relies on that HIA. Nearly 26 million plus interest of 6 million, which takes us to over 30 million. Yeah. Uh, Again, at B, H and B, it said that Mr. Karaki said in the witness sent for trial he'd suffered substantial loss as a result of the actions, uh, and that the reference there is, is paragraph number one two six three fifty four one one two nine two. Uh, and yet here he's saying, Oh I haven't I can't plead any losses. But we say the two positions aren't inconsistent. What he's saying there is, of course, he has suffered losses. Uh, the all ships found, the courts have found, he's suffered 35 million of losses for those actions. It's not inconsistent with evidence in these proceedings that his major losses on the two towers did not crystallise before 2014. It may not be right as a matter of law, but it doesn't affect his reliability on this point or his funds. Agent IC is, it sounds like submissions made on his behalf, and not on, not on evidence of Mr. C one's own evidence. I'm not going to go over to 489D. 
and there it is stated that essential issues such as when he became aware of the bank's case concerning the margin call sees or the bank's case, this is the first point, we became aware of the bank's case concerning the margin call, C1's position is hopelessly inconsistent. In April 2017, he allowed his solicitor to decide a statement of truth confirming that C became aware that it was the bank's case that the 10 million was sought in relation to the margin call when the defendant's defense, the, the, the bank's case in effect of the margin call, the defendant's defense was served in February 2012. Why not? We'll see that, we're going to go there at 1 7. And, and what he then says in these proceedings, I take your lordship too, is uh, he's only very short before trial that he can, I did not know that they were claiming the US dollars 10 million until very shortly before trial. So, so much later that he was aware. And of course, we say there isn't any real inconsistency here. I'll take your lordship to the request just to make this good at 1 7 8 9. Bundle, bundle one. Seven. Eighty-nine. I'm looking for a response. Thirteen point two. When and how did the first claim become aware of two, the alleged fact that the Tamil of Sort was in relation to a margin call? And he says the claimants first became aware that it was the defendant's case and the Tamil of Sort was in relation to when their defence in the proceedings was served. And then he said the claimants did not become aware of the full facts until the cross examination, which is overall consistent. But even the first sentence is consistent with Mr. Uh, Mr. Karaki's evidence, because the obvious explanation is that the claimant solicitor, Mr. Bowden, who signed the statement of truth, was accepting that legally, in legal terms, they would be stuck with knowledge of the defendant's case as from receipt of its pleading. But C1's own personal knowledge did not arise until much later. That's a matter of fact, it's not inconsistent to confirm that. This is what I wanted to say. I've taken instructions from Mr. Bowden, who signed the statement of truth, and that is what, indeed what he meant. Uh, and the Lordship is, uh, wishes, I'm all happy to have the RFI amended in that way, together with supplying the witness statement from Mr. Bowden, confirming the explanation that I've given. I just wanted to make, I wanted to make all those points before the Lordship. So, overall, <coughs> on abuse, we say that they have failed to discharge what is a heavy burden to show that the proceedings are an abusive process um, and that it's better all, for all concerned if we, um, we moved on and stopped having these sort of interlocutory applications if that was possible. Now, I know that your Lordship will hardly relish the thoughts of agreeing to let the DIF court entertain another substantive round of litigation between these parties, but in our submission, uh, and in this case we say and submit uh, humbly that justice to Mr. Karafi does, 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 does demand that. Now, um, on the alternative issues, I've got a point on update your lordship. There's an application to strike out the, the second and third claims as um, parties. And I want to update the Lordship that, that as it's confirmed in our skeleton, the second and third claimants are not pursuing the claims against the bank, and they have confirmed to the liquidator uh, that they will not be pursuing claims against the first defendant either, and so they are quite content to be removed from, from the record. Okay. Uh, that brings me to limitation. Now, this involves the, the second defendant's application to strike them out. The claimant claims in negligence. Those are the ones in paragraphs 127 to 8 and 135 to 6 of the particular claim. 
Now, there are two main points here. And they can say an article night one and night two, and we might just pick them up uh, from the Kenyans. Black bundles, the number bundles of where, for example. <clears throat> what we say it's bundle 30 uh, Cambridge authority is divided 30 And there are two limitation provisions there. The first one, which is uh, where a cause of action arises as a result of fraud, there is no time limit. And the second is whether, is when in claims of negligence, the, the, the earliest date arises on the date which the claimant knows or ought reasonably to know about the loss that gives rise to the cause of action, provided that any action will be fifteen years of the date. Um, now, as we go on nine one, what we say and this is in our skeleton at paragraphs 100 to 107. Is that the reference to fraud can be construed, is not to be confined in paragraph 9.1 is not to be confined to a deceit claim per se, but can encompass a claim of negligence based on fraud, as in the current action. We say, as we say in paragraph 103, if the drafter had intended that a specific claim under this law would have been uh, is that to which there is no time limit applicable under line one. They would have stated there is no time limit in line one in relation to action brought under chapter chapter five, which is the deceit chapter, as they do in relation to the non fraudulent claims in line two, you'll see an action brought under chapter two, three, four. So what does chapter five say then? Chapter five is a chapter five is a deceit claim, but it isn't specified in nine one. So we say if my learned friend's argument is it's confined only to actions legal actions of deceit per se, it would have uh, involving deceit. It would have said any actions under nine uh, under action brought under chapter five, but it doesn't. So if it is accepted that the scope of 9.1 goes beyond the deceit claims. What claims does it apply to? First is that it is limited to claims which, which fraud is an essential ingredient. The second, we say, which is what the interpretation we push forward to, is that it applies to any claim where, as a matter of pleaded fact, the claim has arisen from the defendant's fraud or dishonesty. First, we Pray and aid in that respect the wording of 9 1, where it says, where a cause of action arises as a result of fraud. It doesn't say, as the English equivalent does, based on fraud, but arises from fraud. Now, in England, and as is set out there in the, uh, that reference to the Beaman and Arts case, the reference to based upon is strictly to involve a legal claim of fraud and in section of region. But it doesn't say based upon here, it says arises from. If the drafter had intended to have exactly the same to be bound by the authority there, they would have put based upon. Arises upon, we say, is the language. 
So he didn't use the language. So, so, so why? Now, we say the provision is intended to give robust support to the public policy of bringing forces to put up in this jurisdiction. In these circumstances, a claim of fraud, which is a necessary ingredient, may not be the best claim for, do, for doing so. For example, a claim in unjust enrichment need not involve dishonesty, even though as a matter of fact, it, is present, it might be the best way to do it. The public policy would be undermined if the fraud victim's best claim was limitation. That was barred due to the quirk that it happened, didn't happen to be a necessary ingredient. So it, it, the, there's no specific reference to Chapter 5. There's looser language than England. There's a robust way of, of assisting, uh, of addressing fraud. Um, and if we're right that it could involve dishonest breaches of duty, regardless of whether dishonest uh, it was a necessary ingredient, then it would assist us. Now, in addition to that point, an additional argument in, uh, in favour of this is that if the Lordship goes back to 9.2, And reads the non-fraudulent. Is that nine two or nine two back back in the bundles of, of the of the diff act at the divide of thirty. I'm very sorry, I don't understand. I'd ask you uh, again, claimants' authority, sorry, defendants' authorities, yeah. divide of thirty, law, law of obligations number five yeah, two thousand, right. and goes five four five. You look at nine two. This is the limitation applying to. Negligence claims, in effect, or, or non non fraudulent claims. Yeah. Whereas on the earlier stage, in which the claimant knows or, or reasonable reasonably to know yeah. about the loss that gives rise to the court of action. Now, there, and that's intended to be the equivalent of the English provision. Yeah. Now, the lordship will know. From, in fact, the English provision is wider than that. It's not just confined to when you must. You must not also know. You must just know when you're about the losses, but also that the acts of the defendant caused, can, that they can be attributed to the acts of the defendant. As said, there's two limbs in England. Your lordship can see that, or probably knows it, but certainly can see it. If you go back to 27, divided 27, and, and 14, <laughs> 14A and the Limitation Act, these amend, your lordship will read a 5-2, 525 and going over the page. The period uh, at 4 for the starting date is either 6 years or 3 years from the starting date is defined by subsection 5 below. 5, the subsection is when the earliest date in which the claimant or any person who the cause of action was vested upon first had both the knowledge required for bringing an action for damages in respect to the relevant damage. Just leave it there for one moment, that's what we're interested in. In relation to five of the knowledge required for bringing an action in respect to the means knowledge both of the material fact about the damage, so that's what we have in line two, and of the other facts relevant to the current action. And your lordship goes, what are those other facts? You go to section eight, and the other facts, the other facts refer to section six B above are that the damage was attributable or whole or in part to the act or omission which is the most to constitute constitute negligence. So you have the person who you can sue as well as knowing about your losses. Now that was deliberately brought in 14A to remedy a situation whereby you might well know of the losses but you had no idea that the negligent acts of the defendant had caused it. So until 14A brought in this in, your cause of action might be time barred before you even knew who to sue for it. This is exactly what Lord Nichols uh, was talking about in Nycredit and I just asked for Lordship, to look at, just to look at his exposition, explanation of his introduction. This is in uh, Divider 8 of the Defendant's main players. Divider 8. And he calls it, the, what was before this provision was an evident injustice. And the Lordship will see, it's Lord Nichols, uh, Divider 8. Like reading Edward and Harmon, and it goes from page 73 from H over to uh, B. But also just read that yourself. Yeah. Yeah, 
So that's the explanation. He called that an eminent injustice. However, you will note that there is no such provision in, the, in, the, in 9.2. Yeah. Now this, in cases such as ours, could lead to just such an eminent injustice. I, even on my learned friend's best case, we couldn't reasonably have known about the fraud claims until the middle of 2012. Yet time had already started running, apparently, over two years before this on his construction of 9-1. Indeed, it may have been we would not have discovered this fraud at all for the full six years and lost our rights to bring a claim before we were aware of it. So what our argument is this. Given it cannot be assumed that the law of obligations would want to perpetuate a historic and well-known and evident injustice. We cater, it adds force to our argument that 9-1 was to cater for such situations as these, i.e. negligence where fraud involved, as would postpone the limitation date in our favour, rather than run against us. And that indeed must be an argument about why the language in the, in the law of obligations is more relaxed about the fraud, it says, arises from rather than based on. Yeah. That's our argument on, on 9 1. Thank you. On 9 2, and the second question whether the claimant could reasonably have known going back to. going back to 30. Well, they could reasonably know about the losses, uh, the losses were known before the 6th of April 2010. Now, we accept that the test is as stated in the authorities and my learned friends got us in my credence and the mortgage court. We don't dispute that. We accept that it is arguable, and we go to my learned friend's skeleton here at page paragraph 123. Yeah. And what the 123 they say is that <coughs> these four events happened before the 6th of April 2010 and therefore um, they, they must have lost in the terms of the English law must have, must have accrued and therefore the impact it would be suffered and therefore the date is cut off but our point in relation to that it is definitely arguable we can, we can say that it's a good argument um, but we submit it's not obvious that we have no real prospect of defending this point at trial we say that this isn't suitable for a summary determination at this stage. Um, beginning with the bottom, for example, they say the Alcimai agreement was terminated on the 4th of April 2010, that's when losses in respect of that agreement must have started. Well, that's not quite right, because actually the termination of the agreement uh, was not until the 11th of April, that is after the key date, 2010, and you can get this uh, at, in fact, the defendant's own skeleton at paragraph 57. Yeah, I accept that notice was given. Ah. So that, that's, it's accepted that D is incorrect and that notice was given. Um, as to whether... I, 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 I may not have to make this which is just um, so it, it, what is put is it, it was on the, the agreement was terminated and it wasn't and the question of whether the notice was given to us or to another I think is a, is a, is a matter uh, of significance it also can't be certain on D on B which is prima facie the point of most strength are the attachments of C1's account uh, in relation to the ABK loans and the execution in the curated court in the first instance 
as guarantor in the amounts of 34 million. Mm -hmm. But facially, under English law, that's a strong case. But the Kuwaiti loans are not subject to English law. It's that's because the Kuwaiti law is the law of the loans and the guarantees. And you can see this if you pick up bundle one. A divider 33. Page 513. And at the bottom there, the applicable law, and these are the relevant loans, is governed by the applicable laws of the state of Kuwait and the courts of Kuwait City, which have jurisdiction on legal disputes. So while this is a strong argument under English law that loss is being suffered, it's not clear that under Kuwaiti law that, that loss has been suffered as of that state. And what we do know, because we see it in the particulars of the claim, is that there is no Kuwaiti certificate of liability until 2014. And we see this from the points of claim at 1 5. Shall I give the reference I'll give you the reference. Uh, points of claim, paragraph 96 um. of the points of claim. That's page one, one, bundle 1, divided by 5, 42. Now, it's no limitation defence, although because we haven't had a defence, we haven't had any uh, pleading on what the points of my learned friends are taking, but in due course, were we to go forward and all should be satisfied there is doubt on this, we, could, we would in due course of trial, we could go through and, and work out between QAT experts, no doubt, whether or not the loss is suffered. But it would require investigation of the actual position, so that wouldn't be... Uh, we wouldn't be something that is suitable for summary determination of this limitation claim. And of course, determination of limitation claims in relation to when loss is suffered is historically uh, very difficult. The courts have also found it very difficult, and they have found that in certain cases that it's, uh, have found in, in one case that it's too hard to do, not too hard to do, but unsuitable for summary determination, unless in the most obvious of cases. And that, my Lord, I'll give you a reference is the quite well-known Wardley case. Wardley, Australia Limited, another, and the state of Western Australia, which is 1992-175-CLR. Page 514. I think the reference is... At five three four. Well, we have well, any attention to it. We have to send me a copy. Yes. So, what am I looking at here? Uh, I just I just opened it. It's the judgment of the, the majority judgment of Mason Dawson. Gordon McHugh yeah. and and it's just before the end. They've gone exhaustively to the traditional question. The questions are covered in Forster and Utrid and the credit about when it is exactly losses incurred under an indemnity. And uh, they come to one decision in the end that it isn't incurred uh, in their case because of a contingency. But on page five three three is what I really wanted to rely this judgment on. The possible fight for the after conclusion, the, the following paragraph. We should, however, state in the plainest of terms that we regard it as undesirable that limitation questions of the kind under consideration should be decided in some locked treatises in advance of the hearing, except in the clearest of cases. Generally speaking, as, and the Lord should read for yourself that quote goes down to the end, in particular case involving foreign land. So, yeah. Yeah. 
it, it's not obvious in either of the remaining examples in uh, my learned friend Skellison that the fall from the payments in 2009 or the destruction of the tower that actual losses were incurred as of that time. Uh, that's sufficient for a cause of action. We say the position on all of this would be clearer at trial after proper investigation and not right now in this arena. Yeah. And my Lord, uh, my good news is that I've finished early. So I guess I've also got any questions. No, thank you very much indeed. Well, have a short break, if we may. Uh, have a short hand right in the Thank you. All right. So I just say I've got
I'll, uh, yeah. I'll try to take things uh, more or less in the order that uh, my friend's submissions came. Um, the, uh, there were some matters of, of general prejudice put against my clients, uh, one of them being uh, some things that were said about the first defendant being in liquidation. It was said at one point we allowed the first defendant to get into liquidation, but they said at another point yeah, that was our fault. Um, uh, my the, the second defendant of my clients has, as an offender, accepts and met all its obligations under the court's judgments. Uh, the multiple damages award that was also made against the first defendant uh, was only ever sought against the first defendant uh, and obtained against the first defendant, never against my clients. Uh, the, uh, there is no evidence before the court about the circumstances of the liquidation on the basis of which an offender can make those submissions. There is some tendentious insinuation by Mr. Bowden in his third witness statement, uh, uh, which is not only uh, 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 baseless, but also inadmissible under the practice direction coming from a, uh, an attorney, one of the party's attorneys uh, about some circumstances of the liquidation. Uh, in effect, moreover, there is nothing before the court in which it can even begin to speculate about the reasons for uh, insolvency other than the bare fact that it was on the petition of the, the claimants. Uh, now, my Lord, uh, moving on, the, uh, it, was, uh, it was suggested that uh, my, my clients were in some way uh, culpable because they uh, had uh, took many points below, and I think it was called the first all award offence at some point. Um, my Lord, the, uh, I've made the point to your Lordship in open that uh, indemnity costs were never awarded against my clients at any time. Uh, and uh, in that respect, the Deputy Chief Justice Chadwick could distinguish my clients. And what my friend didn't show you in Model 9, if we can perhaps just go back there briefly, uh, in uh, the judgment he went to, uh, was that by tab 78, Paragraph 19, uh, uh, at uh, page 4228, the very end of the paragraph 19, um, he says, uh, the last sentence, I do not take that view in relation to the second offender. I'm satisfied the second offender did not know the falsification uh, of the various forms. Uh, and uh, the, so there was, uh, as I said, a bit, there was never uh, uh, a case made out that any uh, of the second defendant's employees was aware of wrongdoing uh, of the uh, first defendant employees in Dubai. Uh, now, moving, uh, moving on, my, my friend said that, um, uh, on a theme he came back to several times, that the claims made in the 2009 proceedings and the claims made in the 2016 proceedings are very different. Um, uh, my Lord, they, they absolutely are not. Uh, the first action was for mis-selling of investments of notes uh, and claiming all losses resulting, said to claim all losses resulting from the notes. Uh, the second action uh, is an allegation of lying to conceal the mis-selling, to conceal the fact that the notes were not performing because collateral shortfall uh, had occurred and margin payment was necessary. So it's effectively concealment of the very same mis-selling in the first action, 
uh, and claiming, again, losses said to have been caused in the claimant's own case by the investment in the notes. So they are remarkably <coughs> similar. And when Sir Richard Field, uh, as a French surgeon, referred to radically different losses, uh, his point being made was that they were well beyond trial at that point. It was too late to make those losses because there hadn't been a split trial, which is why I showed you logic paragraph 34 of that judgment. Uh, and insofar as the friend relies on Stuart and Goldberg for some uh, comfort in relation to this, um, in, in my submission, my Lord, uh, that doesn't help him. Uh, the Stuart and Goldberg case uh, was a case in which uh, the reason why they escaped uh, a finding of abuse, the claimants escaped a finding of abuse, uh, having when suing the, set, the defendant again, uh, was because, uh, uh, for a number of factual reasons, but mainly because the claim that was on foot already was a, an easy solicitor's undertaking claim that would have been held up and overcomplicated by some, bringing in some new complex claims. The first proceedings in our case were, of course, themselves very complex uh, and, in, the, in their proper context, would not have been overburdened by bringing in these new claims. Uh, I've made a lot of submissions to you this morning about the role of the statement in the first action, the August 07 statement. Uh, and of course, while we accept that the August statement played a role in the first action, it was clearly part of the subject matter of the first action. That is, accepted and it's indeed, uh, indeed it's a central part of our case on this application because uh, it, it's a, a strong part of our submission that the new case could and should have been litigated in 2009 because it was already a part of that action. Uh, and uh, it is, to say the least, double-edged for uh, the claimant to uh, uh, try to emphasize the importance of the statement in the first action because, of course, in our submission, uh, the, the more he does that, the more it, strong, it points to the fact that the, um, the state, all the claims on the statements should have been brought in that action. Um, uh, I think the friend does that in order to try to improve his position on, on two points. Further, uh, first, on whether uh, the findings in the first action might in future be found to be issue of stopples um, uh, in, in, in this regard, and uh, possibly I think also to suggest that we haven't, um, uh, he didn't gain any litigation advantage first time round because uh, we had a proper go at challenging the statement uh, the first time around. Um, the, my Lord, as to the role of the statement in the first action, uh, there was, of course, debate, as your Lordship saw, about the claimant's leveraging strategy uh, and how far the claimant was aware of the risks. Now, uh, one can have uh, a debate about how important uh, that uh, was uh, in the context of the case, uh, whether it was essential to uh, the district, uh, the Deputy uh, Chief Justice's reasoning. Uh, given the myriad of other reasons he gave for his decision, uh, and even if one were on an issue of stopple basis to come to the conclusion that it were a central part of the reason, as to which is open to debate, um, one's then still got to deal with the question of whether that was fair in all the circumstances that the way uh, that issue of stopple was obtained. And so far as the significance of the statement is concerned, I, I do, it was rather telling uh, when, in reference submissions when he accepted that the second defendant, my client, uh, which had different counsel, different sort of representation um, at trial, uh, left the cross-examination uh, of this evidence to the first defendant counsel, uh, so didn't even cross-examine uh, on that issue. Uh, and I can't imagine for a moment that would have happened if a billion dollars had uh, been turning on this. Uh, and in the uh, Submissions which were handed to your lordship, the closing submissions of the second defendant, which are now uh, in bundle 11, to be in bundle 11, tab, I think 115. Uh, the, the friend read you a passage, but um, the, the interesting thing about this document uh, is that it makes no mention of the conversation in August 2007. <coughs> so uh, it was uh, obviously. Uh, uh, which reflects so which doesn't uh, the closing submissions of the second defendant, the written closing submissions. 
It says, it says uh, in the passage my friend read that the claimant must have known uh, at seven, top seven on uh, uh, page uh, in paragraph 57. Uh, but there's no reference in the document to the August conversations and exchanges. Um, so important was it, obviously, in, in, and so because we hadn't, obviously, the second event had not been alerted to, to the importance of this conversation. Uh, and I was reminded uh, over the short of German, but uh, uh, the second defendant did not cross examine Mr. Taha, uh, who was the, uh, sorry, did cross examine Mr. Taha, but didn't cross examine on this point. Um, Mr. Taha being the financial advisor, the accountant to the claimant, who was the interface between the claimant a lot of the time and uh, the, the bank. And um, indeed, if you remember from the pleadings, Michael, it was Mr. Taha who was supposed to have been told on the pleaded case of the defendants about the collateral shortfall on the 15th of August. Uh, and so obviously it's an absolutely key piece of evidence if you are uh, putting these statements front and centre of the deceit claim. And uh, in the circumstances that pertained at the time, the second defendant, uh, although cross-examining Mr. Taha, didn't cross-examine on this point. And the reference to the, um, uh, to the, to the cross-examination there, I won't go there, my lord, but it's in Bundle 5 at tab 66, uh, and it's pages 2556 uh, onwards. And the, uh, the other reference your logic might need is that Mr. Wally's evidence was that it was, it was Mr. Taha who told about the collateral shortfall, which is in Mr. Wally's witness statement for trial, which is Bundle 3, tab 56, and 1420, which is uh, 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 paragraph 16. Three, uh, and the, the reason Mr. Justice Chadwick, when he came to his liability judgment uh, at 875, 875, in this occasion, paragraph 121, was able to say, uh, as he does, and I don't want to misquote him, so I'm just pulling it out. Um, the reason he's able to say, at page 3925, paragraph 121, there's no evidence of a conference call between Mr. Blonde and Mr. Taha uh, and Mr. Karegi after about this time. Uh, well, one, of, one, of, one of the reasons uh, being that uh, obviously there was no, no cross-examination on the point. Um, and uh, well, it's very hard to believe that a million dollars have, uh, have been going riding on this, that uh, potentially that there wouldn't have been that cross-examination. And my Lord, I... Well, presumably Mr. Black and Mr. Brindle divided up uh, Responsibility for cross examining witnesses. They both had, so far as I can tell, the same interest at least in this issue. Well, my, my lord, it's, it's difficult for me fact to. Both counsel didn't cross examine on precisely the same topic as they were dealing to. No, I don't think Mr. Brindle you know, cross examined on uh, Mr. Taha on this topic either. I don't think he did, I'm told he no, didn't. No, maybe right. Yeah, so neither of the party cross examined Mr. Taha on this rather important conversation. Uh, which is a very important part of the factual matrix uh, of the deceit claim. Uh, and, uh, if, well, because of the way the, the, the pleadings you are. And it, it, it's similar to a friend's, um, well, I, I, I do stand by uh, the, criticism, the, the comments I made about um, uh, Mr. Brindle's cross-examination of the first claimant at trial, because it would, in my submission, have been of an entirely different Order. Your object was shown that cross examination this morning. And a case of you being told about a collateral shortfall, shortfall was put. Uh, but if um, uh, the cross examination then rather drifted off and got, 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 went over a couple of tangents, uh, but I, I do suggest that it would have been of a completely different order and focus if, uh, if there had been a billion dollar claim writing on that statement. Well, maybe said, I'm not quite sure what, 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 there was some document he could have used or the reveal the true position. I mean, well, he could have been, he could have, how many times you can put the same question. Well, he could have put the emails that I showed you last year in America yeah. and so on, uh, for, for a start. And he could have cross-examined Mr. Taha on having been told about the natural yeah. shortfalls, for example. Um, the, uh, I mean, the email, I'll, get, I'll be given the reference on the email, the moment, why not? But the the so uh, and 
As for saying it was an essential part of the case on causation, well, we never pleaded that the claimant's knowledge of the collateral shortfall from August 2007 broke the chain of causation. That wasn't something uh, that we had pleaded. And your Lordship sees that in our closing, we don't even refer to that conversation. So uh, I'll get the reference to those emails in a moment. I think 128. Well, well, I'm not saying that the court would necessarily have come to a different conclusion. What I'm saying is that there was a litigation advantage intended by the fact that the defendants did not understand that anything like the full significance of this part of the evidence. Yes, yeah. it's, it's the fact that if you look at, for example, the email at 464, top of 464. Um, uh, so where have you gone now? Uh, sorry, I beg your pardon. Um, uh, volume 1, uh, chapter 28. Chapter 28. Chapter 28, well, yeah. Okay. Uh, this is an email on the 15th of August, 2007. Yeah. Uh, so, so the 13th, 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 because uh, if you remember the first time plea the defense was that Mr. Taha was told about the clash of shortfall on the 15th of August. And there's an email here uh, from uh, Mr. Blond to Mr. Taha uh, saying, glad you have a good learning experience. Please find the latest research report, which is a portfolio evaluation. Uh, I will, I will Seen today, soon today, be sending you a, a latest portfolio update. Um, um, let's discuss tomorrow the first, sorry, it's the second update, the portfolio update, which, which corroborates Mr. Wanley's evidence that he gave at para 18163 of his witness statement at trial. That's in um, three. So I have lost me completely. Uh, sorry. Let me just rewind. You, you've shown me this email dated the 13th of August, which is from uh, Nair, who never gave evidence or anything, uh, to Tarma. Yes. Uh, saying, uh, I'm enclosing some kind of research report. Right. Now, so what? Well, he was enclosing a, a portfolio update as right. well, which was uh, a portfolio evaluation for the investments. Right. And he's saying, well, let's discuss tomorrow over the phone. Right. So he's saying, I'm going to refer you, or we're going to speak on the phone, right. uh, tomorrow. Right. And it was the first defendant's case that on the 15th of August, there was this telephone call where Mr. Taha was told about the collateral fraud. Right. Uh, and this is corroboration for that, uh, and or at least some kind of corroboration that there was intention to have the call. Uh, and indeed, in uh, Mr. Walia's witness statement for trial, he uh, said in 163, uh, the position on the accounts was brought to the attention of Mr. Taha on a telephone call on the 15th of August 2007. Mr. who well, I think we were supposed to call him Blanc. Uh, but the, uh, so uh, the point here, Marlon, is that in at least two respects, one can, uh, I suggest, uh, see the, 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 the evidence would have gone differently. First of all, Mr. Uh, the first claimant and uh, Mr. Taha would have been. Uh, well, certainly Mr. Taha would have been cross-examined about uh, uh, having been told these matters on the 15th of August, which he was not, uh, and there would have been emails to cross-examine him with. Uh, and uh, also the, the first claimant uh, would have been cross-examined in uh, a rather more vigorous way. And indeed about Mr. Taha having been told about the collateral shortfall. And um, in terms of how important it appeared to the defendants, your lordship, the conversation appeared, your lordship will, I hope, not, not lost sight of the fact I mentioned in opening that this, this, this statement does not appear in the case memorandum or list of issues. So my friend now says, if he thinks it's convenient to do so, it was an essential part of, his, of the claim, his essential findings that are uh, very important indeed. But um, this conversation now said from the front of it is uh, very important indeed and key and essential, different words to use. 
didn't even find its way into the list of issues in the trial. Manov, the, there was some reliance placed on what was said to have been confusion about whether there had been a margin call. Uh, I, I think this is in relation to cleaning the seat. Uh, now, the claim, pleading the claim in deceit, my lord, did not depend on there actually having been a margin call. Uh, as I mentioned before, the, uh, in opening, because the case, the deceit case, which is now approved, is, uh, it is not that, that, that Mr. Malia made a margin call, it's the fact that he concealed the fact that, that uh, they required more margin and lied about why the money was needed. Uh, now, the, uh, there was no confusion that there had been, uh, by trial, that there was a, a collateral shortfall at the time, because in, when the balloon went up and a, and a margin call was actually made a year later, in September 2008, that's when the claimants called in the, the financial experts to uh, crawl over their dealings with the defendants. Uh, and so they, they were aware, at least by then, that there had been a collateral shortfall. Uh, and of course, well, actually, you know, there was a collateral shock for shortfall from the outset. Well, quite, but it's an awareness point, Mother. So it's as to when the, the claimant was aware of That was of one of the difficulties of the mm. yes. conditions of the quality yes. of this investment. Well, quite. So there was no question from an early stage of the proceedings. In fact, probably before they'd started, um, given that they had expert advice already, that there had been a collateral shortfall, and they knew from the time that they received the first defendant's defense, which I showed you, Roger, at the end of 2010, that it was uh, the first defendant's case that the uh, 10 million was used to meet and resolve that collateral shortfall, uh, because that was what the first defendant pleaded under a statement of truth of Mr. Wallier. I don't know if you want to well, look at that. I'm not sure a statement of truth now. From Mr. Malia, as of much. <laughs> 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 well, uh, I think it's slightly different. I'm not sure as Sir John Chandler would treat that as a very telling point. Uh, no, no. Uh, well, I was making a slightly different point. I haven't expressed it very well. Um, the, the reason I was referring to it is this is that um, it's a question of what they felt they could treat. Uh, <coughs> and if uh, I, I completely understand the view taken by the, the view was taken by the judge about uh, following trial about Mr. Mr. Waller. But the point, the point is that the case that Mr. Waller was saying that this was a, this was about margin, and it was used as to meet the collateral, <coughs> was put in the first defence defence. It's uh, bundle two, tab forty-four, paragraph ninety-four. Uh, and the reason I said, pointed out that Mr. Walia had signed a statement of truth is that they knew that was Mr. Walia's case. Uh, they knew from December 2010, 22nd December 2010, that Mr. Walia was saying this was, this was margin. And it was to, to remedy this collateral shortfall of the investments. And of course, they also know at that point what they think was told, they, they were told in August of 2007. So if you put those two together, you ask yourself, why did they plead fraud then, back in December 2010? Because they know everything they need to know. In fact, they pretty much know everything they know now. Um, and then that is uh, uh, further corroborated by disclosure they get, uh, which uh, we know from Mr. Abbott's witness statement, paragraph 30, uh, was it between um, uh, June and August of 2012 which is, we say, the latest they should have been in a position to, um, to think. I mean, all this business about money having been put in the witch's hat, no, uh, was, is really a red herring, because it's, uh, they, have the, they, have, they had the material facts of it. There was a collateral, uh, the bank, there was a collateral shortfall, and the bank was saying that this 10 million was asked for and used to meet the collateral shortfall. And they knew that as long as they knew it. 2010, and they got documents to that effect in, uh, by August of 2012. Uh, so, uh, so far as that's concerned, there was nothing new that they learned uh, that they required to know to plead deceit 
thereafter if they complete the seat now. Uh, the, now, my Lord, moving to uh, a different point, the, uh, uh, my friend said on a number of occasions uh, that the failure to bring the claims in the first action was not conscious or deliberate. Now, uh, the first point to make on that, my Lord, is of course that the Henderson and the Aldi jurisdiction uh, are not dependent on showing that uh, it was a conscious and deliberate decision not to bring it. Your Lordship um, may remember that the very famous uh, statement of uh, Vice Chancellor Wigram in Anderson itself, which we cited in our skeleton at paragraph 9, where he says, uh, if he refers to failing to bring all of your case through negligence, inadvertence, or even accident. So the foundation of the jurisdiction is not at all uh, dependent on showing it's deliberate. Uh, obviously, if it is deliberate, that is more egregious. Uh, and the, uh, and I showed you, Lordship, the, uh, what was said in Stuart and Goldberg about that, and indeed in Clutterbuck. In Clutterbuck, there was no suggestion that it had been done deliberately, but it still troubled the court that there had been a dry run of cross examination. Um, and so far as this is concerned, it is the case um, that. Uh, the claimant says, uh, the, the claimants uh, say in their skeleton 59, they say the claimant, the first claimant did not appreciate the significance of Mr. Walia's statements on the 10 million until after Mr. Walia gave evidence. There's no reason to disbelieve him. And my friend went to this point in his submissions. Now, um, if your logic looks at the the, the truth is that this, the first claimant's evidence about uh, when, he realized, when he became aware of the bank's case uh, concerning the margin call uh, is hopelessly inconsistent. Now, if you uh, were, were to go back uh, for a moment to Bubble 1, Tab 7, Uh, this is the RFR 13 of the framework to, uh, and it's at the foot of page 88. Where uh, uh, request 13 says, uh, when and how did the first claim first become aware? I'm talking about the first claim. First become aware of one, the losses identified in response to the request trial, and two, the alleged fact that the 10 million salt was in relation to a margin call made by the second defendant. The answer of the page is 2, 13, 2. The claimant first became aware that it was the defendant's case that the 10 million was sought in relation to a margin call that the defendant's defense in the 2009 proceedings was served in February 2012. The claimant did not become aware of the full facts until the cross-examination. I'm not saying what extra facts uh, he learned, if any. Uh, and if you, you then compare that to what is said behind tab 19. This is a, an RFI or a statement of truth uh, uh, for Mr. Bowden at page 111, which says the claimants believe the facts set out. I'm not saying I believe the facts. He says the claimants believe the facts set out in this response at page 111. Uh, and then if, if you compare that to what's said at uh, tab 19, what Mr. the first claimant says a few months later, uh, he says at uh, paragraph 14, top of page 165, uh, the claimant brought in these new proceedings, brought these new proceedings based on the fraud of the defendant at the time I made a 10 million payment in August. I did not know until very shortly before the trial in 2013 that the defendants, Mr. Wallier, were claiming that the 10 million which Mr. Wallier asked me to deposit was not to make margin call. These two uh, comments are inconsistent. Uh, because in one passage, he is uh, telling his, uh, allowing his uh, solicitor to make a statement of truth, saying he believes he found out the uh, defendant's position in February 2012, and in another, he say, uh, very conveniently, it was shortly before trial. The, the, there's a, an explanation I don't uh, fully understand was given for that about uh, Mr. Bowden thinking the first answer was in legal terms. Uh, I'm not at all sure how that, uh, it seems to be plain English that the two 
uh, statements are inconsistent. The, uh, now, we're obviously uh, in, a, in a summary process here, but um, there, it obviously leaves us with the deep concern that Mr. Wally, that Mr. the first claim, as he said, first time around in his RFI, uh, the penny had dropped as long ago as February 2012 as to what they were saying about that. And he knows what he th he was told by Mr. Valier. So why didn't he say at that point it's a lie? That's a lie. Now, um, my lord, moving on. Uh, the uh, it was said uh, that uh, by my friend that there are cases like Barrow and Bankside, the lawyers' uh, litigation that the logic was taken to. My lord, that's a case of my submission is of no assistance. The um, and Lloyd's litigation was managed as group litigation, uh, and the claimant's claim that was later found uh, not to be an abuse could not, the court found, have been brought in the earlier litigation because, and it couldn't have been adjudicated on earlier, because of the way the Lloyd's litigation was being managed. So I really don't see how that, that helps uh, the current situation. Uh, the, uh, my friend, uh, on the, on the question of collateral attack, my friend referred to Ridgewood uh, and said uh, that uh, uh, we, have, in order to fall foul of that, they must be alleging that the earlier decision was wrong. Uh, now, this of course begs the question of what was decided in the earlier uh, decisions. Uh, and uh, your lordship has my submission that in form, they were dealing with what did the Chief Justice Chadwick's order decide um, to mean uh, and whether evidence should be admitted. But of course, in substance and in their reasoning, uh, they were saying it's too late to bring this claim. There was no split trial. You should have brought your claim first time around. Uh, and you should have made the claim for these radically different losses at that time. And if you stood back and asked yourself, would the administration of justice be for, to some degree, to disrepute, allowing them to, to, them to go behind that decision. Well, uh, frankly, it, it would, because you've got a court in one proceeding saying, it's too late to make these claims, you should have made them before trial, it's too late now. And then all of a sudden they're allowed to make them a very brand new action. So it would bring the administration of justice into, into disrepute, because it effectively undermines what those judges were deciding in, in, in the earlier case. Uh, now, my friend, Made, uh, made a point about uh, the public interest in pursuing fraud and that it be litigated. Uh, my lord, uh, suggesting, I think, that it should outweigh the abuse in this case. Uh, my, my lord, the, the idea that the public interest in pursuing fraud matters would be frustrated if the claimants were struck out here is, is in my submission, fanciful. Um, the, is, my clients have been pursued for nearly a decade over these investments, uh, including being accused of all manner of claims, fraudulent misrepresentation, uh, right the way through breach of duty, regulatory abuses, and so on. Uh, if, if this further claim was not made in the earlier action, it's entirely the claimant's fault, uh, and there's nothing that would trespass uh, on the public interest in, 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 uh, again, in having fraud properly investigated here. Uh, the, now, uh, some miscellaneous points, my lord. The, <coughs> <coughs> yes, my friend said this afternoon that uh, they couldn't safely wait until they had Mr. Wallier's witness day for trial on the 4th of April 2013 before they plead fraud because that was confirmed by a statement of truth. My Lord, as I've just shown you, Roger, uh, Mr. Wallier had actually made a statement of truth in December 2010, making the same case. So if they wanted a statement of truth in Mr. Wallier, they already had it. Uh, even if they wanted to say he was a liar. Um, the, uh, uh, as to my friend's reasons why he said it was reasonable not to bring the claim, uh, I think I've dealt with most of these in different submissions, but it may be worth uh, pointing out <coughs> that uh, 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 my friend elaborated somewhat on this case, that he said that the hypothetical CIC effectively there would have been a separate um, 
uh, quantum hearing would have been ordered, and therefore we're basically in the same position as we are now, which uh, I think perhaps I'm repeating slightly what I said this morning, but that completely ignores not only the policy behind the rule and you sue a set of, uh, say the defendant the second time, but it also ignores all the economies in terms of time, costs, and the rest of it that we would have made uh, if all these issues had been raised the first time around. The, uh, and I'm not, talk, my mind, I'm not just talking about these duplicative costs in the first proceedings, because a lot of them would be duplicative, because we could have had the causation issues tried together with the other causation issues, and there would be cost savings there. We could have had all the attribution issues to, uh, tried together, we could have had all the liability issues tried together, we could have had the duty of care issues tried together, we could have had the scope of duty issues all tried together, we could have had the remoteness issues all tried together, and the economies in terms of time and cost would have been vast. Uh, I mean, your object knows. Can I, can I just get a grasp of it? Yes. As I understand it, you're, you're claiming that, uh, or maybe I mistake your position, but uh, I thought you were position was that uh, the claimants ought to have uh, made an application to amend their claim sometime in August, say, 2012, yes. to add the claim in fraud and the various heads of damage yes. from which they Now, in August 2012, uh, the position these are the, the existing um, proceedings, and I make sure I understand what they were. They, there had been a case manager, well, I don't know. When had the trial been fixed? I think it was already fixed at that point. I think it was fixed earlier in 2012. It, it was directed by the 22nd of May 2012. Uh, in May 2012, the, the, the proceedings had been fixed. Sorry, the, the trial has been fixed. Yes. Uh, and by that stage, by the time of the case management conference and the, and the, um, the fixture, the case had been, well, I won't say fully pleaded because there were an awful lot of amendments to come. But yes. by then, there was a, a particular claim and a defense. And maybe a reply, I don't know. Hmm. Don't have anything of that. There had been disclosure, correct? Yes, uh, finished between June and August. And the, and the case management conference therefore didn't deal with disclosure. Is it got the order? Yes, it's got the order. But yes, it's quite a long one. I'll have it added to your logic. Um, but was there something in particular that you wanted to know about? Well, I. I'm just trying to get a feel for where things stood in the middle of 2012. Uh, when the application, I mean, as I understand it, one possible process I have to go through is to work out what would have happened if an application to amend had been made in August 2012. Yeah. No? Yes. yes. Well, uh, it's, and this is it's all very easy, all very easy to say so. Yes. But I wasn't a trial judge. Yeah. Um, and I just want to get a feel for where the land lay at that time. Well, the, we'll supply the case management order in my mind. Right, well, perhaps you could give me that. Thank uh, you. The, it, it does uh, deal with amendments to the pleadings. It does deal with um, uh, up to rejoinders, in fact, it would seem, uh, and uh, requests for information. But I presume you set the date for the trials, for witness statements to be exchanged. Uh, witness statements were, uh, yes, and there was obviously an extension because it's, it's Putting an earlier date of 22nd of October, they weren't, as we know, exchanged on the 4th of April the following. Yeah, but I mean, you've got, to, you've got to see what the state of play was at the time the amendment was yes. made, rather than what happened later. No, I, I entirely yeah. agree, my brother. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, if, if, if a further case management conference had been convened in August, it would be in the context of well, the story. Perhaps you would just say what you say would have happened if. Uh, uh, and the, well, the case management conference was conducted by the trial judge, was it? It was conducted by, uh, yes, yes, yes. Well. And um, so what are you saying would have happened if the application had been made in uh, a case management conference had been brought on, yeah. say, in September 2012? Well, well, the claims would have been admitted to the action model. 
Uh, 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 the object may recall this so morning. The, who would have been the, 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 the new claims. The new claims. Right. The, the, the claim would have been admitted. You, the leave would have been given. Yes, yeah. permission would have been given. Right. Uh, the, and what would have happened about disclosure? Well, the, the, the disclosure what would have, would have to, happened about witness tapes? Well, what would have happened about the date for trial? What would have happened? The, what order would the trial judge have made? Well, uh, my Lord, one has to do the best on the materials that one has. Well, you do the best you can uh, and help me. Uh, well, my Lord, what I'd suggest would have happened is one of two things. Uh, and in any event, it would obviously have a, a, meant adjusting certain dates and so forth. But uh, and uh, either the judge would have given directions, he would have admitted the claims, because the idea of having the claims in a separate action yeah, would well, have seemed so, to I him. Get your case on that. I understand yes. that. So, so he, would have, say he would have rejected any submission that he yes. could have enlarged the trial excessively. Yes. Right. He would he have allowed, he would right. have allowed the amendments. So he would have allowed the amendments. Uh, so he, the well, I don't know. It doesn't have, the, the mere fact he, <laughs> they're not actually the same point. He might well have, could have allowed the amendments. Well, there were various things he could have, could have allowed mm -hmm. the amendments. Well, he could have refused the amendment and said, yeah, if you want to run that, take out some new proceedings. And if he had allowed the amendment, he could either say, well, this must be part and parcel of the existing claim, or we're going to bifurcate all this. Mm -hmm. There are all sorts of possibilities. Well, quite, yes, there are possibilities. Well, help me with what you said would have happened. Well, well what I'd say would have happened, my lord, is that you take just, just, it is important to get the first stake in the ground, which is that the one thing that's not likely to have happened is him saying this should all be a separate action. That's very unlikely. That well, he why do you say that? Well, because he could see the case management, the overwhelming case of convenience for having these uh, uh, claims tried together because he, he, the statement is already part of the action. I, I, I see that, okay. Yes. But um, I mean, what would he have done about the trial? Well, he may have had to put the trial back. That's a possibility. If he wanted to have all the claims heard together, he'd have had to direct, um, uh, well, witness statements are not going to exchange, but he may, may have given an extension for witness statements. Uh, he would have had to have another round of disclosure on the new claims, would have had to happen. Uh, and he would have either directed that all the, the claims should come on together um, at the trial, possibly putting the trial back, to do that, uh, or he may have directed there be a split trial of, uh, and, and I mentioned this to you, Roger, this morning, that in, in that event, the most likely split in our submission, given what he would have been facing. Yeah, well, I've got your point on that. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, but that's really it, Murdoch, and all of those scenarios are much more likely than the Deputy Chief Justice saying, no, no, let's have another action in a few years' time, we can start from scratch again. Yeah even though the state is already buying an issue in this action, and in fact your real estate losses are part of the so-called background, and they're said to be caused by the same investment in the same notes. So the, the case management uh, considerations for bringing the claims in, if they're to be brought at all, is in my submission an overwhelming case, uh, and uh, are much more likely than the opposite. Uh, and I mentioned to you much of what actually happened, is that the party were supposed to be ready on liability and quantum the following year in May. There was no split trial, and some, the quantum was to some degree hived off at that point. Uh, but uh, uh, so, so, in the end, uh, had you had your hypothetical CMC, in my submission, you would have ended up with the claims being disposed of in the first action at a greater economy, no abuse of court resources. Because in my submission, even this hearing is an abuse of court resources in one sense, in the sense that we shouldn't have to be here, uh, and your orchard shouldn't have to be here, because this claim should have been brought before. Uh, and this is not an efficient. Yes, I've got the point. I yes, sir. I'm yeah, repeating that, which I'm is not actually terribly helpful. I'm very I do apologize for that. I'm very yeah. I'll, I'll move on. Right. I'll move on. But um, I mean, how do you feed in to this? The, the Bannon position. Uh, did, you, did you also say Bannon position? Well, uh, the litigation funding agreement was made in, I think, early 2012. Well, I got that wrong as well. Uh, 
No, I think it's more than 12. Right. So th this, uh, this um, application to amend is within the, the uh, litigation funding agreement mm. period. Now what? Well, uh, so you're contemplating what the Bannon would have agreed to fund the additional claim, or would have pulled out, or what? Uh, no, the first point, my Lord, which I, which is why I went to the evidence of the claimants uh, in possession, is that uh, they would not have required uh, litigation funding because had they well, chosen to do so, you say they got plenty of money. They got plenty of money. Although I'm not quite sure if they had why they go to that in the first place. But yeah. I agree, rich people can use litigation funds. Yeah. So they, they, your answer is they would have funded it themselves. Uh, well, the supplementary points, final are, are that Vannon couldn't have stopped them because Vannon were not allowed to control the litigation. And my friend made some points about that. Yes, I'd like some help on that. Uh, well, Vannon have no control of, over any amendment. Well, they, they, if he had chosen to, to amend this claim, there's nothing in the agreement that would have prevented um, them from doing so if the claim was had. And if your lordship remembers in the well, agreement, I, I need some help on that. I would be surprised if Vannin has effectively given an open house to any amendment that the claimant wants to add to his papers. I well, think maybe so. Yeah, on the face of it, what they're funding is the existing pleading. Yeah, sorry, I'll just find it. Volume 3, tab 47, my lord, is Vannin. I'm just, just finding the agreement to be lodged. Right. Um, now, uh, you should recall my friend went to clause 8, which yes, is on the right. page uh, 1095. I have that. Yes, uh, which says that what's covered by the agreement is all aspects of the claim as further amended from time to time. And uh, so the agreement uh, it, it applies to amendments, because of course you anticipate amendments, and amendments can of course bring in new claims. Uh, now, uh, the Bannon couldn't have prevented that happening. Well, they could have cancelled it, I suppose. Well, only in the circumstances uh, which are defined between the general cousin and the amended yeah. claim is yeah. hopeless. Yeah. But if, if it's uh, the amendment, the opinion saying the claim is hopeless, they might have uh, cancel the agreement uh, uh, full stop. But we saw the provision uh, at, uh, at uh, 1102, 23.2, saying you can't interfere with the Medal of Medellin proceedings, 23.2, and that's in the Alf Court of Conduct. Uh, so they can't interfere. So if the claimant applies to a band, Bannon can't stop it. Uh, and uh, subject only if your lordship wants to speculate uh, of the particular possibility they go off at that stage and find. Um, a, a, a counsel to say that this new deceit claim is no good. But of course, my friend's case is it's a very strong deceit claim. I kept telling you, Roger, uh, what a strong deceit claim it was. Um, so uh, that you can't stop it. And also, your Roger has to remember that the so-called chaos scenario that my friend tried to portray it was not, uh, it was not, it certainly was not chaos, but that, you, that uh, around the time that Van uh, uh, terminated and renegotiated the agreement. That all happened in 2013, and your hypothetical CMC should have happened long before that. My friend is actually addressing the wrong time period, because they, what one should be looking at, uh, as Lady Justice Arden said in the treaty, at making your application at the earliest possible time before you should have appreciated the defendant's potential liability. That's not in 2013, that's before. So uh, it's at a time when things are perfectly fine with Carmen, and there has been no disagreement of any kind with that at that point. And that's the scenario when they would have been dealing with this one. Uh, and the... Oh, well, I, th I think I may be repeating myself. Yeah, that's uh, the, uh, And of course, if Vannon may or may not have funded at that time, there were good relations in 2012, maybe they would, maybe they wouldn't. Um, but it, even if they wouldn't, the evidence I showed you yesterday shows that the claimants could have funded, and it wasn't just non-liquid assets they had. My friend sought to explain away that evidence of saying that the first claim was liquid, he said. But no, what they were saying when they were resisting the stay proceedings was to say, we could pay this money back from our other assets. We could pay 
Uh, we've got 72 million, and we could pay uh, at least 12 million back if we were ordered to do so if we lost our appeal. So they were saying we're liquid as well. So it's not just illiquid assets, they're saying we're liquid. Um, so uh, the idea that Vannon is a problem, it's a manufactured problem in my submission, because it's in the wrong time period, uh, they couldn't have stopped the thing out. Uh, and even if they hadn't funded, uh, there are other ways to fund. The, um, uh, well, no, I was going to move on from that, unless you want to think so. Yeah. No, it's just further. The, um, in fact, I think I've covered, I was going to address that, and so that's uh, really speaking things up significantly. Um, the, um, yeah, just, just on, I was on the question, uh, when we started to discuss that, I was on the question of, uh, my friend's submission that we're, we're really in the same position we would have been in the 2009 uh, Well, We're not for all sorts of reasons I've tried to articulate, but just, uh, your worship will also appreciate that because we're facing a fresh action, uh, uh, you know, we've already incurred substantial costs in this action, which are, um, and, we, and we haven't even begun properly to investigate real estate losses and so on. Uh, now, again, that has largely happened because a new, uh, there's some overlap. But a lot of new people have had to read into the case, which of course is prejudice to my clients, because had it all been decided the first time around, it could have been decided uh, in the first action with the same people acting for um, the defendants at that time. Now, can I finish on limitation? Uh, and perhaps um, then uh, sit down and bother us. Um, the, first of all, the interpretation point. The, uh, of the Article 91, Article 92. Um, uh, my friend suggested that a reason for giving, for applying 91, the object we want to have is in front of him again, is it's our authorities by the line 10, 30. 30. <coughs> yeah. Um, a reason for applying 9.1 to claims which aren't claims of fraud, notwithstanding the obvious word, was uh, because uh, he referred your logic to Lord Nichols and NICO, uh, and he, he made a submission that effectively, because of the potential injustice in, in rare and extreme cases, that a claimant could uh, uh, be statute barred when he knew about the damage but didn't know the defendant was responsible, uh, that that was a good reason for. Uh, that, that old anomaly was a good reason for reading 9.1 as saying, as applying to non-fraud claims. Uh, well, not, no, that, uh, if that vice is to be uh, fixed uh, in relation to DIFC law, it'll be fixed by how the court interprets 9.2 uh, and what the role of knowledge uh, and so on has to be under 9.2. It is not, and certainly not, a good reason for applying 9.1 to non-fraud cases. Uh, and. Uh, uh, in fact, I was struck listening to my friend on this uh, by wondering what he is saying 9-1 actually applies to. Where's the limit? Uh, he says, he said at one point, uh, uh, as a matter of pleaded fact, having fraud in there, but it was completely unclear how far the limit was going to go, uh, certainly to me, and that suggests to me that uh, in limitation matters, one needs to know certainty, and that was not being promoted by my friend's interpretation. Um, the, the last point I want is that my friend introduced a case on the facts for the first time. Uh, there was a recent Australian decision, I think two evenings ago. Um, just to deal with that quickly, the, um, uh, uh, I think the, the, perhaps two points. The, the Wardley decision, the, the, the Australian decision, effectively it's a case uh, on saying, well, fact-sensitive issues about timing might not be suitable for summary disposal in relation to limitation, uh, and you should only do that in clear cases. Uh, now, uh, the, the, the issue here is that uh, one is not asking your lordship to decide any contentious disputes of fact at all. If we go back to our uh, submissions, uh, please, at paragraph 123, Uh, 
page 38. Uh, now, to, to correct for, sorry, D, the Elsamir agreement was, it was actually terminated on the 11th of April. The um, notice was given to terminate it on the 4th, and uh, it was terminated on the 11th. Now, that, those facts, like all the facts in this paragraph, come from the claimant's pleaded case. Uh, all of those facts are pleaded. Uh, the default at 123A is in, is in 80 to 82 of the particulars of claim. The, uh, uh, the attachments are in paragraph 83. The execution case is in paragraph 90. Uh, the construction being halted is in paragraph 87. Uh, and the notice being given on the 4th of April to terminate else a mere project is in paragraph 100. So none of these are, as far as the claim is concerned, contentious facts. So we're not in the, the territory of the Wardley case because we're not asking the Lordship to determine anything contentious here. Um, so we're simply saying uh, that, uh, that the, the, of course, the claimant would have known all of these matters. He would have known about that. He was a participant in all of these. So, so far as his knowledge of the loss is concerned, for 9.2 uh, purposes, Article 9.2 purposes, um, uh, it's there set out in his own pleading, uh, and those are more than uh, non-trivial losses already incurred. You might not have been able to fully quantify them because of the uh, events yet to happen, but that doesn't mean you haven't got a cause of action. With NICREDIT, if you remember in NICREDIT, um, the cause of action actually arose at the point of the original transaction because the borrower's covenant was thought to be no use. And there was, so there was, on that basis, there was damage already, significant damage already. Uh, so we're not asking you, Lordship, to, to do anything controversial in terms of the facts. We're just going on the, the claimant's own facts. Um, the, the other point my friend made was a point about Kuwaiti law. I think for the first time and without notice, he said uh, that uh, maybe under Kuwaiti law, if these loans are governed by Kuwaiti law, damage doesn't occur until later. And he speculated perhaps on a certificate without any, um, I think, advice on Kuwaiti law or, or evidence of Kuwaiti law. Uh, that came rather out of the blue. The uh, surprise, particularly because the claimant's skeleton, paragraph 16, tells us and told us that we were only required to consider the application of DIFC law on this, uh, on this application. Um, so they weren't making a case based on Kuwaiti law, and in any event, it would be irrelevant. The claims we are trying to strike out are DIFC claims, DIFC law claims, uh, and the limitation uh, would, that's the governing law of the cause of action. So the limitation is either going to be uh, DIFC law as uh, the substantive law or as the procedural law. Thank you. Uh, I, I think during the course of the argument, I have asked for various documents. Mm -hmm. I haven't kept to this document. Uh, I think we have one. Perhaps uh, they make sure they send them to me. Uh, um, my Lord, I can, I can assist you with one matter that you asked me. You asked me for references in the judgment to the witch's hat hmm? of Chadwick. Okay, well, um, if you, uh, I can give them to you now if you'd like. Well, no, let's or, read them up and it's in the transcript. Yes, I'll read them out. The references to the witch's hat in the Chadwick liability judgment are paragraph 27. Paragraph 310. And the other thing I'm wanting now is the full copy of the uh, relevant part of the law of obligations and in particular so I know what Article 38 says and also what reference by chapters 2, 3, 4, and 5. Uh, we'll provide you can follow this about knowing that. Thank you very much. Any more? No, thank you very much indeed. Thank you to our transcribers. And thank you for all your assistance. Uh, which is definitely much to think about. Uh, I will try and prepare a judgment as quickly as I can by making no promises at all. Okay. And um, we will adjourn. Thank you. All right.